in our seat, yeah? Why? <laughs> because we're sitting there.
Koska tämä ongelma on, että niin kun, jos tämmöiset tukee ne. ja se ihminen ei ole sillä hetkellä. Niin, se on kiinni, mitä niin, Mistä kai... toi tulee? Toi? Se, se tulee tosta, tosta koneesta, ja. mutta tota, sitten se näkyy kunnossa. Sitten se on niin kuin No sitten breaking news. Yritetään saada kaikki tänne sisään, niin sitten kaikki on You will start from here, but I think there's a discussion. Yes, because I think that. 
putting the lights in now. Yeah. I have an important announcement for 13 persons. Uh, our travel support desk is closing. It's outside of this room. So these 13 next persons I'm going to announce, please consult immediately or as soon as possible the travel count uh, desk, which is outside. Um, Aruna Tilake, De Silva, Baal, Balasubramanian, Chakvavarti, Chatterje, Shundarokan, Duman, Gosh, Gorajai, Jain, Karashan, Saho, and Divaringe. Excuse if the uh, pronunciation wasn't perfect. So please, these persons, please consult the travel support desk outside this room. Thank you. So thanks, Paul. I hope everybody got to hear that. Um, and certainly those who haven't uh, collected the DSAs, if you could do it right away, because the desk will be closing in a couple of minutes. Okay, here we are for the closing plenary. We've been here for three days in this building, listening to great keynote lectures, two great keynote lectures, a really stimulating policy panel yesterday, lots of parallel sessions, very parallel, thought-provoking presentations, and a lot of words, concepts, themes that are kind of cutting across in different sessions, obviously jobs, social transformation, women's work, technology, automation, uh, Digitech. And it's been great listening to all the different sessions and different papers. But we now need to come to a close and bring all this together, to take stock, to look backwards, and look forwards. And so what we're going to do in this closing plenary is we have an eminent experts panel here. Well, we're going to try and sort of go back in time and look at the conference the last three days and also take us forward in time and think, of, think about the policy issue, research questions that we should be thinking about for the next few years. So I'm going to introduce the panel right now. So we have from my left to right, Armid Ali Javana, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and the Executive Secretary of UNSCAP, Elliot Harris, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Chief Economist of UN DESA, Naila Kabir, Professor of Gender and Development at the Gender Institute, London School of Economics and Political Science. Ravi Kanbur, T.H. Lee Professor of World Affairs and Professor of, of Economics, Cornell University, and Chair of the UNU Wider Board. So here's the question I'm going to ask them, same question. I'm going to ask them to speak for five minutes each, because one thing I did realize the last three days, there hasn't been that much time for you to ask questions. Time has been constrained in different sessions. So here's your chance, your last chance to ask great questions to the panelists. So we're going to have the panelists speak five minutes each, that's okay, and then we're going to have questions from the floor. So the question I'm going to ask them is the following question. What are the three key learnings from the conference? One key policy challenge, and one key area for future research for early career researchers in the audience. So three key learnings, one key policy challenge, and one key area for future research. That's the question. And I'm going to ask Ibarme to start off. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kuna. Uh, it is indeed uh, has been a great three days here, yeah? although I didn't have the opportunity to, to attend all the sessions. I, I attended several of the sessions here. Yeah? So based on at least yeah, the sessions that I attended as well as the a keynote the first day and uh, the, the, the last plenary uh, where uh, Richard Baldwin uh, gave this uh, maybe lecture, yeah? So what uh, my observation, the key takeaways. First, structural transformation does not happen in a vacuum. That's clear, yeah? Because it also uh, affected by the particular economic system, even the political system, yeah? institutional framework, initial endowment of a particular country, as well as the choice of public policies. Yeah, and I think uh, the sessions in the conference have brought yeah, the, the, the various uh, aspects as well as experience of many countries uh, to, to, uh, to the fore. Second, second, yeah, uh, I also observe yeah, from the discussion is that the structural transformation dynamics going forward will be different. 
Yeah, so that's why I think, uh, of course, yeah, uh, lessons learned, historical, uh, economic uh, perspective, and so on, very valuable. But going forward, because because uh, certainly of this digital technology advance, uh, definitely the dynamics will be different. Yeah. So therefore, the question is how, yeah. Uh, with this changing dynamics, the countries uh, can uh, benefit from these new dynamics. And then from this angle, uh, the, 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 the second, second takeaways, I, uh, this is my personal bias, yeah? I would like to see more how we can harness the potentials. Of course, there are the down risks, downside, and so on, yeah? This double-edged sword, yeah? Everybody understand that, but then how, yeah, to harness more the potentials. Third, <clears throat> third, uh, we have to go beyond a mere structural economic transformation. I understand that uh, for many of us who are economists, yeah, including myself, we, we tend to have this bias, yeah, more on this structural economic transformation, uh, industrial sector, you know, services, all this uh, economic, yeah. Whereas structural, transform st structural transformation is bigger than a structural economic transformation. And I think also many yeah, of the session have discussed this uh, at length, uh, very interesting. Uh, of course, it's not straightforward as, as, a, a, simp uh, as a more, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, uh, select discussion of structural economic transformation and then uh, policy implication yeah policy implication one policy implication that I would like to see from this discussion is how uh, again uh, the more the positive angle yeah how we can benefit from this structural transformation for example uh, several countries have done this greatly to to accelerate uh, uh, poverty reduction yeah, uh, using this digital technology, yeah. uh, and then this is more of this policy implication angle. Yeah, we need to to learn more. Yeah, from the country that's successful in this, and 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 uh, related issues. Last point is uh, area of future research. Again, I'm 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 looking from the perspective of regional commission. Yeah. Uh, our, re our region or sub-region, uh, one of the speakers yesterday have uh, taken up this angle. Yeah? Uh, several countries in our region are quite different in, in their, their, uh, you know, their, their development challenges. For example, Thailand is undergoing very rapid uh, aging. Indonesia still young population. Neighboring countries maybe still young population. So therefore, yeah, again, uh, the challenges is uh, because this kind of issue is not for each particular country only yeah? to, to, to solve or to look, yeah? uh, including the implication for their uh, structural transformation path. Yeah? So the, 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 the question, and this has to be supported yeah, by a solid, a very good research, but maybe more complicated yeah? because it will involve several countries in the region and so on. Uh, the economic transformation, structural transformation, broader, and so on and so forth, including uh, population dynamics, yeah? And then what would be the policy implication, uh, including also the kind of regional cooperation, yeah, maybe, yeah? Uh, the potential of regional cooperation that comes from that uh, policy issues. Okay, so I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bjorn We move on, Elliot. Uh, thank you very much, Kunal. Um, I was struck uh, in, in several of the presentations by the, the fact that we see structural transformation happening in a way that it doesn't correspond to the traditional concept of moving from agriculture into manufacturing industry and then gradually into services. Um, I think the, the term coined was the process of, of tertiarization. Now, at the same time, several of the presentations talked about how the growth of productivity is, has been uneven by country, by region, and even over time. And it is not necessarily being led by that whole process of structural transformation. Now, this implies, for me, that uh, there's scope for productivity-enhancing policies to be deployed. 
that target high value added activities, that target skills incentive uh, activities, which could accelerate the structural transformation that's underway without necessarily having to go through that three step stage that uh, traditional theory seems to imply. By the same token, what we saw in many of the presentations was that agriculture still has the potential to provide the lion's share of employment in many economies and, and to contribute most significantly to poverty reduction. And policies for rural modernization or for linking or bringing technology in and linking forward and backward out of the agricultural sector could help accelerate uh, poverty reduction. Now, if you combine those two, a situation where you're not going through the typical stages of development through manufacturing industry and then thinking about what Professor Bolden said this morning, and we have this advancing tertiarization in many developing countries, and that calls into question the typical ability of a country to use manufacturing-led export growth as an engine of development, which raises the question about what should be the engine of development for the many of these countries. And I think we do need to spend some time on disaggregating our data analysis to understand better the differences between the services, the types of services that, that can be offered, the value added that they contribute, and how that can fit into the development model. The second point that I drew from several of the presentations is that inequality is rising, but not only because of structural transformation. There are, in the case of Thailand or Vietnam, there were compelling bits of evidence put forward that there's a very clear regional bent to the, to the inequality. And that then um, indicates for me the scope for spatially differentiated policies to compensate for that, that um, governments can put in place policies to spur growth or to change the nature of growth and value added in, in underprivileged regions, and that it, that can happen in parallel with the whole process of structural transformation. It doesn't have to depend on that. By the same token, however, if the structural transformation is happening and it is not always pro-poor, which is indeed the case as many of the studies have proven, then that does put a, a, a premium on policies that can compensate also for that, working against some of the income distributional outcomes of the structural transformation process. But for that to happen, it, th this has to be very clearly identified and the government has to see its own role in taking on, allocating resources, taking on the vested interests to make sure that that kind of inequality is not exacerbated by the structural transformation process itself. The third one, the third thing that I found really interesting was this question of the differential impact that technological change or trade and globalization can have on jobs, depending on what kind of jobs you have. Are they cognitive or manual uh, jobs? Are they routine or non-routine jobs? And that, of course, uh, means that different workers with different skills and with different types of activities and occupations are differently affected by the process of technological change and by the insertion into the global trading system. I think it's, it, that signals that it's really important to understand the nature or the structure of your workforce and the types of occupations that are there in order to ensure that the process of technological change doesn't lead to the complete loss of employment. I mean, I thought it was rather scary what uh, Richard Bolton was talking about this morning. I mean, if, if manufacturing activity doesn't generate any jobs, we, we have a problem. Um, but by the same token, it's understood that the patterns of, of work and the patterns of skills will be affected themselves by trade and by technology. And that leads me then to the policy challenge that I see, which is I think we have to, uh, policymakers have to understand very clearly the different types of, of workers, the different types of, of occupations, and the differential impact that trade and technology will have on the structure of an economy in order to be able to guide it. They will be able then, if they understand these things correctly, to, de to identify the education and training policies that can build up human capacities and enable shifts into higher value added activities or enable workers perhaps to seek employment in areas that are less susceptible to being rationalized away or offshored or phased out completely. But by the same token, in order to do that, given the pace of technological change, then there will need to be uh, arrangements made for lifelong learning, and that is not a, an easy task at all, requires quite fundamental changes. And there's also a need for social protection and labor market measures and measures to reinsert workers that are adversely affected by technology and by trade. The just transition, in other words, can only happen if we know whom we have to protect and help. 
topic for future research for me would have to be how digitalization is affecting the nature and the pace of structural transformation in developing countries. Um, and I won't go into much detail here, just to say that what Professor Baldwin said this morning about moving into the trade and services and then saying that this is something for middle income countries leaves me really puzzled about well, what sort of development advice we will offer to low income countries which do not yet have the level of human capital and the level of digital infrastructure that will enable them to take advantage of this new transformation. Thanks. Thank you, Elliot. Naila? Okay. Um, I attended the thread around, largely around women's work, and so, uh, and a couple of other things, but I'll try and focus on that. Um, I think there's kind of one key takeaway and then three sub takeaways. And I think the key takeaway is what comes out of a conference like this that brings together people from different parts of the world and so on is that, you know, we tend to use the shorthand of men and women, boys and girls. But really, we are not talking about binary categories at all. We are talking about internally highly differentiated categories. So we started out by looking at the way the, at the gender, at the geography of gender, how it varies across the world in terms of uh, inequalities in labor force participation, wage gaps, and so on. So men and women across the world experience barriers uh, to the market in very many different ways. That was one variation. I think a second variation is within countries, there is the whole issue of the intersection of gender with class, ethnicity, race, and so on. And that, too, will introduce um, inequalities in gender wage gaps. You know, where are you in the income distribution uh, according to your ethnicity, according to your race? And one of the things, of course, that's come out, uh, was touched on occasionally here, is that unlike the OECD countries, where the gender wage gap is characterized by a glass ceiling, in the poorer countries, we see a sticky floor. And we've seen it in, in some of the work coming out of India. I think we saw it in Turkey and so on. So what we have to understand then is if you go over a threshold of education, skills, wealth, maybe the inequalities are not as severe. Maybe you get jobs in the public sector where discrimination cannot be as rampant. But if you are poor, unskilled, and so on, then the kind of gaps that you face, the hurdles that you have to overcome are likely to be larger. And the third variation is, of course, across the life course, that we do not experience discrimination in exactly the same way uh, in different sections of the life course. And I've just come back from the ADB where they're talking about the, the silvering of the population. And of course, the silvering of the population sounds very romantic, but it's a co uh, uh, associated, I think so, you know, it's better than graying, um, it's associated with greater uh, gender gaps in poverty much larger gender gaps in poverty. But there were a number of findings in, that came out of the studies here, which sort of led me to think a little bit. Uh, one was from Vietnam, and the fact that as children, girls and boys have very similar aspirations about the kinds of jobs they want. I'm not sure you would find that in South Asia. You know, girls are already kind of socialized from a very young age into having lower aspirations. Uh, and yet in, in countries like Vietnam, perhaps from an early age, girls are are not discouraged from aspiring. Um, the issue of unpaid work and domestic work and childcare and so on. You know, the silvering of the population means that elderly care is now becoming more important and it remains a part of women's responsibilities. The extent to which uh, we take account of other forms of unpaid work, and um, I think the last session talked about unpaid productive work, subsistence work, which is often missing from you know, the, the, the dichotomy between market-oriented work and unpaid domestic work. There's a whole other area of looking after cattle, gathering firewood, etc. So I think it's reminding us again that for women in the reproductive ages, who are also women in the productive, prime productive years, they have to constantly try and balance this. And this idea of you know, access to quality work it's not going to happen on equal terms unless this area of women's work is taken more account of. 
And a couple of other findings is how the gender of the workplace matters. And there was a study from Pakistan that tells us that it may not be the gender composition of the workforce as much as who, what is the gender of your supervisor? Who's your boss? Um, and you know, that often matters. Who is the person you are going to uh, uh, be accountable to directly may matter much more than how many other women or how many other men. I'm not so sure that can be generalized, but I think it was an interesting finding. Uh, the other finding was about, you know, do you have a friend? <laughs> you know, there's a critical mass. You need, uh, in order to be able to break barriers, to ask a woman to do it on her own is highly costly. But as the study from uh, India and self-help groups showed us, is that if you go along with at least one other person, the likelihood of being suc making successful use of opportunities is likely to be greater. And that gives us a slightly different story to the first one, is we need a critical mass of the minorities in order for a workplace to become far more hospitable. We also found that diversity is conducive to innovation. Uh, and again, we're talking about intersections here. Uh, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, and age diversity. All of these appear to contribute to innovation around marketing, innovation around enterprise, and so on. And these are things I'm not sure policymakers have as yet accepted as much more than as rhetoric. Um, I think those are sort of, uh, you know, if you like, the three variations, but this morning and yesterday's discussion about technology to me uh, raised questions about the challenges, both in terms of research and policy. And uh, something you said, Kunal, yesterday um, stuck in my head, and that is, you know, it's going to be a long time before you have, you're able to automate hairdressing, right? And this morning's discussion was how we've moved from mechanizing manufacturing to the mechanization of services. But there are certain services that are going to be quite hard to mechanize. And of all of those, I think care services are going to be hardest. Because if we think of artificial intelligence, it seems like it's no longer intelligence that differentiates human beings from everybody else and from robots, right? Because we can have robots that are intelligent. So it must be some aspect of our humanity is about caring. And uh, feminists have made a distinction between caring about and caring for. We can mechanize caring for. I understand in Japan they have robots now to, um, for the elderly, for some of the elderly care. I think we're having robots for sex work, but they don't care for. So there's a whole section of us, that, uh, part of us, that is essentially human. And that is about how we care for others. And if we don't value that care work, and if what, again, came out of this morning's policy recommendations, let's forget manufacturing and so on, let's look at skills, services, information, knowledge. Let's look at the human economy. Then we have to take this whole uh, valuing up of the care work that is being done right now on an unpaid and undervalued basis far more seriously. Because I think everything else can be mechanized. But what we're leaving behind, the thing that cannot be mechanized, is also the thing we value least. Thank you, Naila. Ravi? Well, the uh, disadvantage of speaking last <laughs> is that everything that's worth saying has already been said. So I will say things, but they've already been said. So there you go. Um, so let me start with a quote from Antonio Gramsci who said famously, the old world is dying and the new struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. And I think that's sort of the discussion of technology, I think, reflects that. Uh, but I think it raises a couple of questions on the analytical side and on the policy side. Uh, on the analytical side, it actually raises rather a deep question about uh, how to learn from the past uh, when the present is changing very rapidly and the future is very uncertain. In fact, can you at all learn from the past is, is the sort of deep question that, that, this would, that this would raise if one took it seriously that really we're into a major, major change. And the point is, of course, that our whole enterprise is built on the notion that you can learn from the past and the present for the purposes uh, uh, of the future. Uh, William Faulkner, again, famously said, uh, the past is not dead. 
it is not even the past, which is very comforting for us who analyze uh, past data. And Alfred Marshall, the, pa the patron saint of neoclassical economics, uh, the epigraph to principles of economics was a, was a Latin phrase, natura non facit saltum, uh, nature does not move in jumps. Okay? And there were two, two uh, way, reasons why he said One is because he, he introduced differential calculus to economics. And of course, differential calculus is the mathematics of infinitesimally small changes. But the other was that there's a certain continuity in things. Uh, and therefore, learning from, from today can in fact help you tomorrow. So that's the whole basis of our, of our enterprise. And yet, uh, if the new world awaits to be born and the past can be no guide, how do we, how do we address these things? And I think that's a, that's a very deep methodological question for us to be, for us to be thinking about. The next, my next question is if in fact the future, my second big question is if in fact the future is so uncertain, how do we plan? How do, how do we, what, what, what are the implications for policy uh, in, in, in the context? And uh, let me talk about that in the context of income distribution and income redistribution. Uh, I, made, I started making the series of points actually after the, after the financial crisis of 2008-2009 when I and many others were saying this is the new normal. The new normal is we're going to get financial crisis, we're going to get crises. But the point is we don't know where it's going to hit, how it's going to hit, which sectors are going to be hit, but something, something will happen in the next, uh, uh, is bound to happen, and that's the new normal. How do you then prepare for that? Particularly, my interest was how do you prepare in terms of protecting the most vulnerable from those shocks? When actually you don't know what the shocks are going to be, you don't know where they're going to hit, you don't know how they're going to whatever. And a sort of very typical economic, uh, the sort of Marshallian way of thinking about it is, well, uh, I'm going to, uh, this shock hits, I'm going to work out the specific policy for that. Th then this other shock hits on tourism, I'm going to work out a specific thing for that, okay? And of course, what the financial crisis revealed was that, that we have to move very fast on these things. Uh, so in fact, many of us argued in, in, uh, for IDA, the crisis response window for IDA. Uh, and many of us argued that actually it was too slow. You should have pre-prepared, you should have pre-prepared criteria that countries satisfy, so that when certain criteria are met, the money flows, and not having to go through World Bank procedures, uh, uh, which will take several months and so on. So, so that's one aspect of it. But on the ground, the design of uh, design of protection for the vulnerable, I argued, can't be on a so to speak on a case by case, crisis by crisis, technological change by technological change basis. Now coming to the current thing. Uh, rather, when you have the a future which is very uncertain, generalized methods, generalized schemes of redistribution, uh, generalized and generic schemes of redistribution are what, are what is needed. That's the way of diversifying our risk. So no matter where it hits, you have mechanisms for redistribution through the system. You have transfers, you have this, that, and the other. And in fact, I propose that we assess existing social protection systems with that in mind, with that in mind. So you do, just like we do, uh, uh, just like we do stress testing of financial systems. Well, what, what, what does the stress testing team do in uh, the FSAP, for example? They imagine uh, a crisis like this, and then how will the banking sector react? Uh, and my proposal, we, we imagine a crisis of the type, and we see how will the social protection system, as it currently stands, respond? And then we should design one, which will be robust to a whole series of these things. And I think the same class of arguments, of course, you know, we can talk about the specificities of this, but as a generic point, the whole uh, 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 a, a generic response to the uncertainties of new technology, particularly from the point of income redistribution, I think is that, is that the case for a diversified general form of redistribution in place uh, uh, is greatly strengthened uh, as opposed to a case-by-case -case thing, which is our natural instinct. Our natural instinct on Marshallian grounds, other grounds, is, well, you wait till the thing hits, then you, then you design this thing. So that will be my, my sort of second big picture point. My third point is really to do with, with, the, with the young researchers. It's not really in terms of topics. I've already told you what topics are interesting. But it's more about to do with the mechanism and how we use conferences like this uh, to advance uh, the work of young researchers. And this is to you, Kunal, but also to you, Ibu, and to you, Elit, since you, uh, uh, you also preside over conferences of this type. Now, we have, uh, we have uh, great junior researchers from the south. We also, of course, have great senior researchers from the south and the north here. The meetings between juniors and seniors has been somewhat haphazard. Uh, serendipitous would be a nice way to put it, okay? You run a get coffee with somebody, whatever. But actually, let's face it, the seniors stick together and the juniors tend to stick together. So my proposal 
which I've suggested in other contexts, is to have a more systematic way of bringing junior researchers and senior research researchers together, uh, not on the sort of, uh, just the randomness of well, this session we all together and so on and so forth. And there are different modalities that we can think about that, uh, of doing that, matching uh, uh, common interests. And then setting aside uh, uh, se separate sessions for either on a pairwise basis or, or small groups for them to meet. So that would be my very sort of concrete, specific process proposal uh, in terms of young researchers, the topics I've already talked about in a very big picture way. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. Elliot, Ibu Abarudha, Elliot, Nailan, Ravi. Let's give them a hand. So we have, uh, thank you for being so succinct in your interventions, which is nice because we now have possibly 40 minutes for Q&A. So I know really, as I said to you, I want to maximize time for questions and answers because this is the time to ask the questions you really haven't had the chance to ask yet. Having said that, do keep your questions short and to the points. We can have more, more questions than otherwise. So I'm going to take about four questions. You can ask it to a specific panelist, or you can ask the panel in general. And so let's try to get a few questions in, and let's try to see some hands going up. Who's going to go first? Nobody yet? Andy, OK. Yeah, uh, if you take for the moment the future, the idea that the future is the service sector, and Nihilus points and other people have made the point about care services, you could probably make similar cases around sort of education, health, other public goods tend to need human interaction. And uh, you know, thinking, you know, starting to think myself about, you know, you, 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 you could teach students through the internet, but it's much better to have them in front of you. Yeah, you can, you know, it's, uh, it has limitations. So th thinking about the, if you, I mean, the, put, there's, a, there's a separate question about reviving manufacturing, I think, but if you assume for the moment the future is services, how do you make services work to reduce poverty, create inclusive societies, and not just benefit the kind of medium, high school trained people? So that's, that's one question on my mind. And then the other question I was thinking of is, um, it's really this redistribution question. Uh, I really like the young and, young and, uh, young and older researchers' idea as well. Um, the, uh, just on that, I mean, there's, you know, in, in sci hard science in the UK, you get these things called sand pits. I mean, it sounds terrible, and there's not literally sand, although there could be, I suppose. Um, and then you basically put people in a comfortable room with lots of bright colors, and ask them to solve, not solve a problem, but maybe come up with a way of approaching a problem. So you could have a, you could have a project, you give people the question, or you, they frame the question, and then you, they go off and, and, and do the sand bit. Uh, but my question was slightly different. I think there's a whole range of social policies and ideas around universal basic income and these sort of things that theoretically the surpluses generated by the tech sector might support. I wonder how the panel feel about some of these new ideas whereby people could have, uh, if you can sort out the obvious issues around getting the rich and large companies to pay their fair taxes, uh, what would you do with the money? How would you, how would you, would you go for universal basic income or universal basic shares where people actually own, you know, the kind of, uh, those sort of ideas? So those are my couple of questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. There's a question from Selim at the back. A uh, very quick question. My name is Selim Rahan. Uh, uh, none of you actually mentioned uh, about SDGs. Uh, sitting in an UN premise, uh, are you pessimist or optimistic about SDGs? Very good question. Right. Great. Some more questions? Don't see to see any more hands. Why don't we start with these two questions and we can then take some more. And anybody can go and uh, first have no order here. I just might want the SDGs. <laughs> I'm not sure I entirely um, understood what you meant. I mean, a lot of what we were talking about, without speaking directly to the SDGs, is about the, the basic principles of the SDGs. We're talking about structural transformation. That, that is SDG 8 and 9, if you want to look at it that way, as the basic enabler of any other kind of progress. We talk about inequality in SDG 10, which was specially reviewed today, and we've seen that this is obviously a problem that requires a clear answer if we want to get to any kind of sustainable development. 
in many respects, I think it's good that we can talk about these things without having to constantly remind ourselves that it is about the SDGs, because that means the SDGs have mainstreamed themselves into the types of questions that we're asking. And so we're not asking about something esoteric or, or, or something that might be a problem sometime in the future. We're talking about today's reality and how we fix the problems for today so that we can get to the, the aspiration of sustainable development. I, I do think that that's uh, something I didn't anticipate in 2015, but we're there. That, that, that is where we are now, that people do find that to be the guiding principle, the guiding framework. On, on this question of redistributing the surplus, um, uh, I think that that requires a whole social conversation that hasn't happened yet. That can only work if there's a consensus in the society that there will be that redistribution of surplus. And in a world where a lot of that surplus is generated outside of any one society's borders, I suspect it would be rather difficult to come to that kind of a, of a consensus. So that one would be, in essence, trying to introduce something that would work best if it were indeed universal across all jurisdictions without having the universal agreement that we want to move in that direction. I think that would hobble it, at least uh, in the immediate, in the immediate uh, term. Um, I think, uh, you know, to pick up on what Andy said, uh, it, it does worry me, and it is linked to the question of redistribution. It worries me uh, being in the UK, but I suspect it's happening elsewhere, the extent to which market principles are entering into so many areas of human life that used to be governed by a concern for the public good. So in academia, I think uh, the language of clients and customers uh, is increasingly uh, permeating. You know, in the health service, um, you know, the, the old bedside manner, you know, you go to your GP, you've got 15 minutes, and the entire time his or her eyes are on the computer because they have to fill in various forms rather than attending <laughs> to what's wrong with you. So, you know, and, and this is being done in the name of efficiency. But it seems to me, you know, when we talk about productivity enhancing uh, approaches, you cannot enhance the productivity of caring for people. You know, for that, you need to give people the time and the, the commitments. So the issue of redistribution comes in because if indeed we are going to be losing large numbers of jobs, and if indeed the surplus that comes out of automation and the new technologies is going to be captured by a fairly small section of the population, you know, what happens to all those people who are doing this kind of work in, a, in an undervalued and unpaid basis? And therefore, you know, I agree with you, there's a conversation that has to be had. But I think one of the things that Ravi says is we can start with what we have. And what we have is uh, expanding commitments to social protection. And to me, the, those expanding commitments to social protection should not just be seen, it, it should not just be seen in terms of, you know, being prepared for any form of crisis and shocks, but it could be seen as a, a redistributive mechanism which we invest in creating um, the kind of knowledge, skills, human capital, health economy which will you know, serve us all, no matter what kind of automation we get. I hope that kind of makes sense. Uh, on the universal basic income, I wanted to ask uh, this to Ravi in particular, uh, and following what Andy asked. It seems to me that on UBI, if I can call it in short UBI, uh, there seems to be kind of two dimensions. One is instrumental dimension, the other is a normative dimension. And I also think I get the impression that norm, the instrumental dimension often applies to developing countries, and the normative dimension applies to developed countries. So what do I mean by that? So when it comes to uh, your know, universal basic income the argument is you can't really target you know poor people because you don't really know who, who people are who are poor or not it's imperfect targeting you know social programs often go to the rich sometimes so the best best way to try and get around that is to essentially have universal basic income you don't have to worry about targeting so it's a kind of a compliance problem of lack of compliance which leads to the thing of why we might have universal basic income that's an argument i often hear about in developing countries the argument i hear in developed countries are very different 
machines, robots coming in. We've got to worry about those who are being replaced by robots, tax the robots and finance that, use that to finance the, those who are losing their jobs among the workers who are essentially being replaced by machines. So it's a different di dimension that's more normative dimension. Now, I just wor worry that this dimension seem to be almost like the different spheres of the world. And is there a problem there? And I, so that's my first question. Another question is, if you did think that's a way to go, universal basic income, as Andy's uh, suggesting, how would you do it? If that's something that's actually possible, at least in the global south. Ravi first, but maybe others can jump in too. So we can have a very big discussion on, uh, on uh, uh, both the narrow economic aspects of UBI and uh, versus targeting uniform universalism, et cetera, and as well as the norms, and of course, not to mention the political economy uh, aspects of it. So we could be here forever for, for that, uh, in that, in that thing. My own, my own view has been that although I'm, I'm inst my instincts are in favor of universalism, uh, it, it has to be something that's resolved on, uh, on a context-specific basis. Depends, G given where we are now, uh, how, do we, how do we move? But one point I would make is that uh, and there's something that in the air, which is that this new technology is going to solve all our problems, okay, to do with the, well, no, and this is what Elliot, I mean, the, the, real issue, the, the real fundamental issues with the redistribution are actually a social consensus on that redistribution. The fact that you can, the fact that you can open a bank account and do this, that, and the other easily, which is often presented as a solution to those, to those social and the deep fundamental structure. I'll give you, give you an example of this, if I may, uh, from, from the uh, Rural Employment Guarantee uh, thing. I know in the, the initially it was uh, the workers did their work and they came to the, under the tree, the, the, uh, the, uh, the person was handing out the notes and the thing. And of course, you know, he was a village headman and he would keep, he would keep something in his pocket and then hand. So I said, now what do we do? We open a bank account for each worker and then we transfer the thing directly. So pro corruption, a, pro a problem of corruption solved. Well, actually no, because when you, when you go to the bank, uh, it says, really, the, the thumbprint doesn't, uh, you know, whatever. So you, give, you have to give over a certain amount to get. And then when you come out, the village headman's still standing there uh, to collect the, the share. So the notion that somehow these deep-seated structural issues uh, can be magically resolved, of course, they can be helped in different ways through technology, I think is, a, uh, is something that I, uh, that I myself have sort of uh, tended to lean against that, against that win. So that's how it's, I, I, without going to the detail of UBI versus this versus that, I would want to make that point uh, or, uh, for, the t for the techno optimists, if you see what I mean. Anybody else wants to bring uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if I, I, I may uh, want to go back a little yeah, on this SDGs, SDGs uh, issue yeah, that was raised by uh, Selim. Uh, again, because this conference is more of an academic conference, yeah? not, not so much a uh, policy maker. And, uh, or uh, UN conferences as such, yeah? Then actually, yeah, because I've, uh, I've been in three different conferences, the academics, the more policy makers uh, type conference, and the UN conference, yeah? Well, you know, the, the, the conversation uh, has been quite different. In UN conferences, yeah, including GA, yeah. Uh, next, uh, next, next week we are, we are going to have this uh, GA and five, five summits. Yeah. The the conversation is more SDGs. Everything is SDGs. Uh, even even uh, agencies or like us. Okay, whatever your website has to be SDGs. Everything SDGs. Yeah. So the conversation is that SDGs. Yeah. So SDGs first, and then uh, the rest comes. Right, but in academic conference such as this, is you 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 talk more on on the, the issues, yeah, and then you relate that with uh, research findings and things like that, yeah. Uh, whereas what you talk is actually SDGs, yeah, uh, that uh, Elliot already alluded earlier, right? So, a uh, 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 policymakers um, discussion is more, of course, pragmatic, yeah, probably, and then because everything is driven now by SDGs. As that as this angle, yeah. So I think uh, there should be more coherence, yeah, in the conversation. What I mean is, of course, uh, the objectives is the ultimate objective is not the SDGs, yeah. But what, uh, for example, uh, poverty reduction, uh, welfare, and so on and so forth, yeah. 
so for the people to understand better actually you need to be more uh, user friendly yeah not so much the sdg because it's a bit abstract yeah so how how to to land that yeah in the the more common language yeah so uh, this is what i see yeah that maybe in the conversation yeah uh, okay poverty reduction uh, but then of sdg number whatever is fine yeah uh, then um, actually yeah uh, governments because i was in government before actually government is is uh, very smart yeah they they don't so much you know uh, you know uh, get uh, getting confused about this what they they are doing is they mainstream the sdgs uh, they, 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 the term is how to mainstream SDGs yeah, into the development uh, objective and so on. They are doing that, not so much the SDGs, yeah, but mainstream SDGs, our ultimate objective is this human resources development, connectivity, infrastructure and so on, but they mainstream SDGs towards that. And last point is, because again this is academic conference and UN you wider, UN you wider is the research arm actually yeah of UN yeah uh, again actually this is more internal con co conversation but I see uh, the need also uh, how among us yeah uh, to also have a more interaction yeah then we do not have to for example SCAP yeah uh, we do not have to do that deep research on certain where it's better you and you but then you feedback also into us yeah which does not happen. And until now. Thank you. But I want to press you, and also Elliot, because of both of you, since you are your direct observers and participants in the SDG process, we are 11 years away now, 2030, right? We've already seen from the Secretary, Secretary General's uh, report on the SDG progress, significant lack of progress in many parts of the world. And of course, we know they're mostly in LDCs. And so 11 years away, we probably could not go to meet the SDGs in many of the countries that we see. And yet the sense is that how do we get to those? Get to that point. The MDGs had clear indicators, feasible, feasible, much more feasible, perhaps. It's easier to get a child to school than to make the child learn. So, what is exactly to be done in the next 11 years, especially in many parts of the world where there needs to be progress on SDGs? And how do you see, from your perspectives, on what are the key actions that has to be done in the next few years? Whatever has to be done has to be done really in the next couple of years if you really want to see uh, the, many of the country reaching the SDG goals. If I had a magic wand and could wave it and change one thing, I would force, if you will, order the integration of policy. And what do I mean by that? I, human society is organized in the silos that we hate so much. We don't have a super ministry that does all policy. We have a ministry of education, we have a ministry of health, and it's more rare than we think that these ministries collaborate with each other. And when we make estimates of what has to be done to achieve the SDGs, we take each individual area, we figure out what the resource requirements are, and then we accumulate them. And by doing so, we deprive ourselves of all of the gains that we would make simply by doing policy in an integrated fashion. And the example I'd like to give of that is we have health objectives um, that we want, to, we want to achieve, and we spend a lot of money and effort on secondary and tertiary health care to get to those objectives. Whereas we could spend a whole lot less money cleaning up the air and the water and preventing those health problems in the first place. And because we don't take that into account, we don't act in the places where we could have the greatest impact. And I think that that, more than anything else, is what our societies need to take seriously, that it all hangs together and if we take advantage of how it all hangs together, we can achieve much greater, much faster progress than if we try to handle it separately. So that's the first point. The second thing, though, is that we say that we have to do it in partnership with everyone, but more to the point is that we don't really believe that. We still want it to be led by government and done by government. We talk about mobilizing government revenue, and then the private sector has to contribute. But what we're not really doing is sitting down to understand, well, how do we rearrange things so that these partnerships can actually work effectively? And in many respects, we bemoan the fact that poorer countries can't mobilize the resources that they want, 
without asking ourselves how could they mobilize the resources that they need? What do they need to put in place to get the resources to flow, whatever the providence of those resources? And I think that that is part of the problem that we're facing with the SDGs is we know what we want to achieve, but we have not yet accepted that we have to change the way we go about achieving it. And perhaps that is one of the things that we can learn from common conferences such as these, because in the conferences that we go to with the policymakers in the member states, it's much more difficult to have that open discussion about what might work differently but better because we're stuck in how does it work today in the real world. It's the aspirational part that we're missing. So that, that's what I would say. Could I ask uh, Elliot a question? And it's going to be, it's, a, it's not a fair question. Uh, and it might be, you might talk about magic wands. <laughs> but it's the question you asked about, uh, you mentioned about uh, the conversation we need to have about redistribution. Have we started having that conversation? If not, how do we start it? And if we have started it, how can we further it along? Because I do think, uh, given that we all recognize the obscenity of the inequalities that we are now facing, I don't know how we can continue without having that conversation on the agenda. I agree entirely with you. I think that that is the biggest downfall that we face today because our political class is not willing to tell people in honesty there will be losers in this transformation. And, and that, that's always been the case. We've always had transformations that generate winners and generate losers. The, the difference now is that these losers, are, well, let's say the transformation is much more rapid, it's much more fundamental, it's much deeper, and the losers are on your cell phones and you can see them out, out in the street and everybody knows about it. And yet that conversation doesn't happen. And I think that is one of the biggest weaknesses that we face right now. We can't build the social consensus around a just transition because we're not even willing to admit that there is a need for the just transition. And so people end up lost, they feel uncertain, their jobs are under threat, and the demagogues come along and promise that they can solve it all by pointing a finger of blame at the other one, and they fall into that trap. Now, if we want to talk about redistribution, we have to understand that we are going to be telling people that the way the outcomes are generating themselves is fundamentally unfair and fundamentally unsustainable. And if we can have that conversation and point out that by agreeing on a certain form of redistribution, we make society itself more sustainable, then perhaps we have a chance of designing a system that, as Ravi said, is in place before the crisis hits and then we can we, we can adapt it to deal with the particular crisis, but until we have that conversation about what is going wrong, well, we can't design a remedy, and that's what the political class needs to do, and I don't, I don't see any prospect of that in the immediate term. Do you want to, do you want to say something? Okay. Let's take some more questions from the floor. Peter here, and Tony there. So let's Peter first. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, Deepak. Okay. All right, so just I'm going to reject the order. Deepak, Peter, and Dona. Okay. Do you want to go? Yes. Uh, if we can get the conversation going between the panel and the floor, I would like to draw attention to something that has remained unstated, and I'm puzzled by it. Uh, to me, the primary challenge confronting economies, whether industrialized or developing, rich or poor, uh, or indeed, the past, the present, and the future is employment. Uh, that in the past 25 years, rapid economic growth and prosperity for some have not been associated with commensurate employment creation. This is, in fact, a crisis both in industrial societies and developing countries in the present. And we've discussed it in the context of the future in terms of how technological change might affect employment, how gender discrimination might affect employment. Uh, but the problem, in fact, has become uh, perpetual. Yeah? I mean, since the early 70s, uh, the age of markets and globalization has not produced employment. Now, could we think of that as a challenge? Because after all, the theme is transforming economies for better jobs. It could just as well be transforming economies with more jobs because employment is not just about well-being. It's about dignity 
for people in the process of development. So I'd quite like to see what the panel, hear what the panel thinks of this as a proposition. Well, it's good that Deepak got to ask his question first because my question really follows on from his and I think adds to it. Transforming economies for better jobs. One of the themes that I have heard here in the conference is formality versus informality in the job market. Jobs in the formal labour market sector, I think, qualify as better jobs because they pay better, the instruments of social protection, regulation, are operating there, whereas they're not in the informal uh, labour market. What do we have to say about what it takes to increase the share of employment that takes place in the formal labour market? What do we really, what are we saying there? Is it, are we saying that economic growth would take care of it by itself? If not, what are the impediments to expanding that share of employment was, that's within the formal labour market, and what policies can be adopted to facilitate that process? Um, Ravi um, was quoting Antonio Gramsci, um, the old world is dying, uh, the new world struggles to be born, and, and now is the time of monsters. Uh, at the time um, Gramsci wrote that, he was... Um, languishing in a fascist prison. And the, uh, the world economy was in a process of disintegration and crisis from the 20s into the 30s and into the Second World War. And as a result of the Second World War, the United Nations was born on the ashes of the League of Nations. And one of the primary missions of the UN has been the prevention and ending of conflict and violence in all of its forms. So, you know, while one of the tasks and a very important task of the UN is uh, development, uh, is the SDGs, it's also preventing and ending conflict. So the question for the panel and indeed I think for the conference is transforming economies can lead to better prospects and more social peace and more justice, but it also can be extremely destabilizing. So, you know, when we connect up the economics with the politics, with the primary missions of the UN of development connecting to peace and, and justice, how, how do we do that? Or are we sort of sitting here as perhaps people sat in the League of Nations in 1938 you know, just before the onset of the, of the time of monsters. So that's a, a bigger question for the panel, indeed for the conference. All right, thanks. Keeping in mind what Ravi said, that we have a lot of early care research in the Global South here, and we need to do a better matching problem maybe later, next time. But I would like to see a few more questions, especially from researchers who've come and early care research in the Global South. So let's try and get some questions. Really from all of you are perhaps sitting. One question there, from there, anybody? A couple of more questions. And then we're going, to, we're going to go back to the panel. Some more questions from all of you. Really haven't had the time to ask questions or didn't? Yeah, I can see one hand right at the back. Is that? I'm not sure if I can see right in front. But anyway, let's go with Pu Ying first. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I haven't really thought this through, so I'm not sure how coherent I will be. But uh, I just wanted to follow up with uh, Deepak's question about generating employment. And, and what kind of employment. So uh, just briefly, I've always felt that there was something wrong with economics ever since I started learning it. Uh, one of the SDG's goals was ensure sus is ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. So how do we, jobs are predicated on consumption and production. And if um, there's increasing inequality uh, and, uh, and, and, and then there's environmental um, threats, then we cannot keep producing, then we won't have jobs. So is our entire model, is there something wrong with our entire model? And, and if you're talking about jobs, formalized jobs, uh, what, what is it? Is it working in an office, working in a bank? Do we all really want that? Um, there's this experience, um, taking a bus going through London, and then you see all these people in all these windows sitting there typing away at their 
uh, computers? Does everybody on Earth want that? I don't really think so. So um, this um, placement of value on jobs, on work, is it what society is made of? Should we start off economics with learning um, Adam Smith and uh, Ricardo and uh, Alpha Marshall, or should we start learning uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, uh, Weber, things like that? So it's just some ideas that have been floating around in my head. Just thought what the panelists might have to say about that. That's a great question. What do we mean by better jobs? We haven't even defined that here in this conference. Okay, some one or two more questions from researchers, especially younger for research in the Global South. No? Okay, can... Okay, well, no, I think, Anthony, you, you're, you're already counted that category. Okay, let's go back to the panel and you can answer. Employment becomes to be a recurring issue here. Different kinds of employment. Yeah. What's your goal first? Yeah. So again, it's a, uh, a tough set of questions, uh, both in terms of formality, informality, and, and employment. Uh, there are tough set of technical issues of uh, how our st uh, statistics are measured in, in terms of for measuring informality and informality as well, and even conceptually, what, we mean, what do we mean by formality and informality, even in a conceptual sense? Uh, so uh, uh, let's, let's leave, for example, in the, just to give you a small technical, in, in the Indian context, uh, one of the key uh, statistical ways in which we identify informal enterprises is essentially through, through the 1948 Factories Act, and we say uh, enterprises less than 10 workers, let's say, okay, so nine workers or less. And that's how, that's how we actually all these things, of, uh, 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 the share of informal employment in manufacturing has not, uh, has not uh, fallen. That's, how, that's one of the ways in which we get this stuff. Uh, but suppose, in fact, that the natural size of enterprises is going down because of new technology and so on. The natural size of employment. So even with no, nothing else, uh, 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 the um, enterprise size will be going down. So one has to, in some sense, correct for that uh, through, uh, when one uses official statistics. So that's just a small, small point of the sort of technical type uh, uh, issue. But let me go back to the question of dignity and, uh, and employment. And I think uh, I've come across this not in the employment context, but in this universal basic income uh, that, that, style, uh, that type of uh, question, where, in fact, part of the debate is that uh, simply giving somebody a uh, hundred dollars or a hundred rands is different from that person earning that through the sweat of his or her brow and that, that uh, and I think that's that's a very important uh, 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 debate the thing that I would say is that while we understand the economics of redistribution <laughs> not very well but reason, reasonably well the, the uh, the sociology or the, or the acceptability of different forms of redistribution we don't understand that well. Okay? Uh, so uh, that, that would be my... So, you know, the citizens of Alaska get uh, a check for what it is, $2,000 every, every, every month or whatever, whatever it is, the Alaska Permanent Fund. That's just a straightforward transfer. They don't have to work for it and so on. And nobody in Alaska says, you know, this is an undignified form of receiving the thing. They say, no, this is my right. I receive the thing. Okay? And yet, if you were to do the same thing in a different context, we say, oh, that's, that's very undignified. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is what is considered to be a dignified form of earning, of earning is, is very much context and, and time and time specific. Uh, so that would be my, my, my sort of uh, uh, an observation in this, uh, in this context. So then, you know, in, in, in South Africa, I mean, my South African friends will tell you that sort of young people walking along uh, the, the motorways picking up rubbish on the street, wearing the high-vis stuff. Okay? That's a public employment scheme. Of course, that young person would rather have the 100 rands than not have the 100 rands. But when you do qualitative analysis, of this, that is not considered to be a dignified form of receiving the 100 rands. Okay? And you say, well, what do you want? What, what do you consider dignified? You say, give me my old car factory job back or give me a government job. Okay? Even though those cars couldn't be sold, <laughs> Even though that steel would have to be just dumped into the, dumped into the sea, but that is, that is what's considered to be a dignified form of earning. So those are the sorts of uh, uh, issues, I think, that we, uh, that we face. So suppose we could magically wake up uh, and planting trees was considered to be a dignified form of, of labor. 
uh, uh, to save the environment and so on. Then, of course, we'll be, uh, uh, we, in some sense, we could solve all these problems at, at the same time, but that, that is not where we, that's not, not where we are. So I think those are some of the difficulties. Uh, and in my own writing, I've said that while we understand the economics of these redistribution things, the incentive effects and this, that, and the other, uh, not very well, but reasonably well, uh, it's the social acceptability of different forms of redistribution that I don't, uh, that I don't think we understand. We economists certainly don't understand that. Uh, very well. So that was my, it's not an answer to your question, Deepa, but it's, it's a response of some sort. Um, could I pick up a bit? Um, I wanted to go to Tony's um, uh, point about conflict and the issue of employment. And I want, I mean, you know, if we are talking about trying to bring down levels of conflict and, you know, end some of the conflicts, I, you know, I guess we have to work out what it was that generated the conflicts in the first place. And quite a great deal of the conflicts are generated by a sense of grievance, of being left out. And I'm not talking about major wars here, but I'm talking about everyday forms of conflict, small-scale conflict. So it seems to me that it's not that we have not had, you know, there has been forms of work generated in these last 20, 30 years, but they are not forms of work that give people the kind of uh, living standards and dignity and so on. So it isn't a form of work that makes you feel included and part of a society. So I feel like, you know, the, the issue of conflict, uh, addressing conflict, and the issue of giving people forms of work that make them feel that they are contributing, they are counted, uh, that the state's um, munificence, et cetera, extends to them, I think those would probably go hand in hand for me. Um, you know, there are the other forms of conflict that have far more deep-rooted uh, reasons, but I think quite a lot, and not just conflict, just criminality, you know, the kind of everyday uh, breakdown of law and order and so on, all of these, I think, are linked to this, um, you know, sense of being excluded. On this question of of jobs and how we create enough employment and good jobs, better jobs. I give you an anecdote. I was sitting once with a, a very good friend of mine, goes back to the school days, and her 26-year-old son, who'd studied film, was explaining what he does. I didn't understand it. And I didn't know that was a thing that you could earn a living from. And I asked him, I was getting agitated, what about security? I mean, he says, I, I don't have any, but it's, it's fun. And I said, well, how do you plan your career? Oh, I don't have a career. And I'm getting more and more frustrated and more and more antsy, and she's tapping me on the arm and saying, it's all right, it's all right. He likes it. This is a, an activity that is generating an income without the kinds of sort of surrounding characteristics that we, my generation, has often thought of as being a good job. It's not a profession. It's not a career. There's no job security yet. It seems to fulfill this young man's uh, desire. And is that a good job or not? I had no idea you could earn a living doing what he does. I couldn't describe it to you now. But that just illustrates the point that as the world is changing ever more rapidly, as new technologies get deployed, new activities will arise that we cannot anticipate today. We just have no way of doing so. And so when my friends from the ILO talk about decent work. I think about the principles that should be respected in any kind of activity. So it shouldn't be inimical to your health. It shouldn't destroy the environment. It should, you should have a certain amount of dignity and certain amount of protection from any kind of discrimination or exploitation. But as to what exactly that job might be, I can't know. And so I would suggest that the policy implications here are that you set the parameters beyond which you don't want any activity to go, any social, social parameters that should guide the way in which our technologies are deployed and the way in which we generate activities. But we don't try to steer those activities and we don't try to set expectations of how many of these different types of activities we should have. Let us just enable as much as we can through policy, through investment and, and through education and hope that we are enabling enough employment to be generated. But by the same token, I will say this now, um, and perhaps I shouldn't, we complicate our own lives when we realize that we are growing as a population much faster than we can generate jobs 
to occupy everyone. And we talk all the time about generating the jobs. We never talk about managing the population. And I wonder why that is. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think I'm going to take uh, take up of what uh, Elliot just started, um, and I'm not sure whether in the sessions yeah, during the the conference uh, this has come up. Yeah, which is a gen generational change, uh, because uh, in other conferences yeah that I attended uh, previously, uh, this has been uh, quite a big topic. Yeah, especially in the emerging countries such as my country Indonesia. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the corporate sector, I think, has been much faster. Yeah? For example, these um, millennials, the gener Generation Z and so on, and how these new generations with their changing demand pattern and so on, yeah, also already change yeah, the demands for certain products, services, and so on and so forth. Yeah? And therefore, also generates a different kind of jobs. Yes, so uh, this is entirely new, new world. Yeah, maybe not in uh, every country, but certainly in the emerging countries where the population is quite young. The the, the conversation is like this. Yeah, for example, again in Indonesia, it's, it's like this: uh, millennials and how uh, all, all that kind. Yeah. So therefore, one or two examples. Yeah, of the kind of jobs that are uh, you know uh, uh, growing. For example, yeah. Uh, tourism or broader, uh, this hospitality business is big, right? Uh, like hotels, restaurant, transportation, they support that. And second, uh, creative economy. Yeah, uh, creative economy, like, like again, uh, again, the example from my country, creative is so big. Yeah, uh, everybody is, is, is working in that. The younger generation is working in this kind of a sector, yeah. So I think uh, this also needs to be researched further and uh, taken up of, uh, as a future uh, policy uh, research agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bjorn Almeida. I'm going to uh, bring this particular session, the closing period, to a close. But, uh, for, um, but I want to thank Ibu Almeida, Elliot, Naila, and Ravi for your insightful comments and, dis and the really, really nice discussion. And can we have give a show? Before we, we actually sort of leave this room, I wanted to make a few closing remarks. And uh, first I want to say to all of you that it was great to have you in this conference. Really thank you for your, what you, your contributions, your participation in this event today and yesterday and the day for, before yesterday. It was wonderful. Hope you enjoyed the conference. Hope you enjoyed the comments and papers that you received, conversations you had. It was useful for your work. And hope you met many new people working on this topic around the world because that's the point of this, of this wider different conferences. This is important. We'll be sending your feedback form by email to share, uh, to share with us your experience and takeaways from this conference on Tuesday. You will have some weeks to get back to us, but please, please do give us feedback so that we know what worked and also what can work better, because we can always improve ourselves. We're delighted to have cooperative with UNS CAP, and there's no question that we had a great time in here in this location, in this building. The support to the conference is deeply appreciated by all of us in the UNI wider who has been involved in the conference preparations. And thanks very much for that. And let me thank all of the UNS CAP. I'm not, I'm not sure where they are, but we, I know that, that some of them are here. And thank you very much for what you've done in the last few days. The conference wouldn't have been possible without my wonderful UNI wider colleagues, especially Tram, Thule, and Ruby. If you don't mind, if you're here, could, could you please stand up? I'm not sure. I don't think I can see any of you, actually. Were they? OK, all right, OK. All right, there's some, there's some here. And those making sure things flow nicely from here, in, here in Bangkok, if you don't mind standing up, whoever is here of the UNU wider team. I can see some people at the back, Paul, Kennedy, Annette. All of you, fantastic. And of course, not just here. We had a great team back in, in, in Helsinki, too. And so thanks to, to them, too. It's now time to say goodbye. But please keep in touch. Connect with UNU Wider on social media and newsletter. I hope you all have subscribed to UNU Wider's angle. That's very important. 
keep up to date with latest publications, research collaborations, and other news. There's a lot of new projects coming online, lots of new calls for proposals. For those of you who are working on different topics, such as social transformation, informality, women's work, social mobility, you'll see lots of new calls, so do get involved. You might think, you know, that this is, after we finish this great conference, a large conference like this, you and your wider takes a break. We just chill out for a few days, and we don't really do anything. No, we don't. We already got the next conference lined up. That will be in Helsinki in June next year. And then, so that will be essentially we're going to make public information of the conference fairly soon. And the theme of that conference, this conference was on SDG 8, recent work. That one will be a global partnership for, for sustainable development, SDG 17, which is a really important SDG, which you often really don't talk about very much in, in this discussions, among, especially among economists. So thank you, and safe travels, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Wider staff, if you'd like to come to the front.